was... Uh... And now I know we need to credit it all to you. <laughs> well, no, <laughs> don't do that. That would be totally wrong. No, wait, how do I do this? But I, I'm curious because prior to this, you had produced a, a show, a TV show called The Million Dollar Recipe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> has, with Food Inc., has your, uh, your perspective on food changed dramatically from that place? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I did actually, prior to The Million Dollar Recipe, which was about the Pillsbury Bake Off, I, I'm kind of uh, cursed by food. My first <laughs> film was about a hot dog stand in Los Angeles, Pink's Hot Dog Stand, and then I worked with a guy. We did a, a show with Peter Jennings on Frito-Lay's effort to globalize the potato chip. Mm. And that was actually the, the most interesting thing because they gave us pretty full access. We went to China, we went to the Netherlands, and we were really looking at their global strategy to um, push potato chips on the world. And, and I actually contacted the people that I had worked with there when we started doing Food Inc. because I thought, you know, even though that show raised questions, they did it and it was, they, they liked the product at the end. So I thought maybe we would be able to get them involved in Food Inc. and, and they, they said no. So I think that there's been a, a change in um, kind of how willing companies are to, to talk. Well, it, it's not just the companies either, though, because it's a trickle-down right. impact, as we see on right. the chicken farms. Right, right. No, that's the thing that, that, you know, I mean, it almost became a joke because <laughs> this was a very difficult film to make. It's because it wasn't just the companies that didn't, that didn't want to talk. We had a really hard time getting farmers and growers to, um, to agree to participate. There, there was a lot of fear, and, you know, we didn't expect it when, once we got out there and started filming and started trying to get different farmers to let us see what they do and to talk to us. We just, we just had a lot of doors closed, but very different reasons. I mean, both, you know, a lot of people didn't want to participate, for, but for different reasons. And the chicken farmers, it's, it's a form of indentured servitude that they've been sort of roped into by the, the chicken companies. Uh, but other people have other concerns. And I, you know, I knew a lot about food issues going into it, and they are terrifying. But almost more upsetting to me was essentially the elimination of free speech right. that is discussed. Right, and that's you know, and that's really the point. I mean, I get I, we we're all being asked a lot of questions about you know what you will eat, what you know what what will you eat, what we won't, what won't you eat, where do you buy your food now, and and I mean that that's obviously the film is about food, but but we really realized that it was about much more than food, and and actually that moment with um, Barb Kowalczyk, who's whose son died from eating the hamburger when when Robbie asked her, you know, very innocent question, just how has this changed the way you eat? And she couldn't answer. You know, after that interview, we just kind of looked at each other and we said, we, we'd already been encountering some of this, but from her, you know, somebody who's a food safety advocate now, we were really shocked to find that even she was kind of reticent to speak freely. Doesn't that seem crazy? I mean, like, that that is one of the principles America's all about is free speech. Right. And here you are, a producer of a documentary film, worrying about your words. Right. Well, that's the thing that became so interesting about this film. Our process of making the film became the same subject as the film, you know, which, which doesn't happen often. We were kind of censoring ourselves in the same way that these people are censoring themselves. And we were, you know, we spent more money on a First Amendment lawyer than, you know, yep. Robbie says than any of his films combined, and and every correspondence, you know, went through this First Amendment attorney, and you know, it, it created a lot of kind of internal dialogue just among our filmmaking team, and we took things out of the film that um, that we knew were true. The way we eat has changed more in the last 50 years than in the previous 10,000. The modern supermarket has, on average, 47,000 products. The industry doesn't want you to know the truth about what you're eating, because if you knew, you might not want to eat it. We've never had food companies this powerful in our history. Everything we've done in modern agriculture is to grow it faster, fatter, bigger, cheaper. If you could grow a chicken in 49 days, why would you want one you got to grow in three months? When you go through the supermarket, there is an illusion of so much of our industrial food turns out to be rearrangements of corn. 
sometimes you look at a vegetable and say, okay, well, we can get two hamburgers for the same price. They have managed to make it against the law to criticize their products. There is an effort to make it illegal to publish a photo of any industrial food operation. I find it incredible that the FDA wants to allow the sale of meat from cloned animals without any labeling. Peanut butter contaminated with salmonella. E. coli has been found in spinach, apple juice. Smells like money to me. The average consumer does not feel very powerful. It's the exact opposite. When we run an item past the supermarket scanner, we're voting for local or not, organic or not. Look at the tobacco industry. The battle against tobacco is a perfect model of how an industry's irresponsible behavior can be changed. Imagine what it would be if, as a national policy, the idea would be to have such nutritionally dense food that people actually felt better, had more energy, and weren't sick as much. You know, now, now see, that's a noble goal. People have got to start demanding good, wholesome food of us, and we'll deliver, I promise you. You know, there were certain stories that we just kind of dropped because they were too hard to tell. I mean, we, we filmed, um, we did more filming in Kentucky and where they, there was a lot of kind of battle going on about a lot of the, the there were more and more poultry farms popping up there and they smell mm -hmm. and there were a lot of um, people who were upset about the smell and feeling that the smell was potentially harming them and, and we just discovered that it was very difficult to film smell. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the weird thing, it's like because I know so much of the production and I know a lot about meat, the one thing I didn't understand is you have the section about hamburger filler. Right. Which and I'm still not quite sure what that is. I don't even know when you see that assembly line being controlled from Oz or wherever it is. <laughs> uh, uh, the stuff is going I don't know what it is. I don't know I don't know what the, those parts are. Right. What is that? The white the the, the ammonia going. treated blob. They <laughs> they take trimmings, mm -hmm. you know, which are the pieces yeah. from other when other but, when you know from other slaughterhouses um, or processing plants, I guess you would call them, and they they take the meat out of it and they call it lean. That, it's called lean, uh -huh. um, and they they put it through this process, and and it ends up being something that is added to hamburgers, right. and you know it's it's in a lot of. So it's folded in with the other hundred carcasses that might be right. So one you know when you get burger. ground beef and it says you know ten percent lean, or you know you, they're different ah. fat content percentages. They can they can control how you know the the fat content. They not being this this place, right. but you know the people who make your ground right. beef can control how much fat is in it. According to Vince, I believe it's Vince. Uh, it smells like it smells money. like money. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Something about that southern accent just makes yeah. it all the, the yeah. more no, frightening v Vince to me. Is a, Vince was an interesting guy. <laughs> because you now you you did go to him a number of times. Well, we we had taught. He's one of the people who we had spoken with a lot, right. and um, and we you know, had an appointment to come meet him and our plane landed and there was a voicemail from him and, and he had kind of changed his mind. So we went straight to his house and, you know, Robbie said, why you, you think they don't want to let us in? And, and Vince answers that question. <laughs> Causal connection there. <laughs> Decide for yourself. I, I want well, that, I mean, that was, you know, because we spoke with Tyson too and they, mm -hmm. won't, they won't outright say you know, they, they said Vin, it's Vince's choice. Right. If he wants to, uh, if Much he like wants suicide to. is your own personal choice. <laughs> you said that. <laughs> you're, trying to, you're trying to set me up. <laughs> I wouldn't do that to you. Would I do that? I don't think. Would I do that? No. Maybe. <laughs> um, and actually, one person who, I don't know if he kind of pops in the film, but Troy Roush, the, the corn farmer, mm -hmm. is another really, really amazing person who, you know, just makes you think about farmers in a totally different way. Right. And he's he's very well traveled and he you know he goes around the world meeting farmers in different countries and um, and just really completely um, expanded my idea of who a farmer is today. And he had his own run in with Monsanto that right. he talks about in the film. Right. Uh, and it's we won't make it about good or bad or anything like that. But if anything 
Monsanto has taken over the majority of that business, mm -hmm. say that, right? Um, do you think there's any way, if somebody wanted to, not you, but somebody, do you think that trend can be reversed in any manner? Or do you think their 90% domination of the field I think is... the thing that would change things would be if the, if the patent laws were changed. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, different attorneys have taken these farmer cases and tried to make them about, about actually reversing the patent laws. And I think that's what would have to change.